Welcome to the reading, A Course in Miracles, Chapter 5, Healing and Wholeness. Introduction. To heal is to make happy. I have told you to think how many opportunities you have had to gladden yourself and how many you have refused. This is the same as telling you that you have refused to heal yourself. The light that belongs to you is the light of joy. Radiance is not associated with sorrow. Joy calls forth an integrated willingness to share it and promotes the mind's natural impulse to respond as one. Those who attempt to heal without being wholly joyous themselves call forth different kinds of responses at the same time and thus deprive others of the joy of responding wholeheartedly. To be wholehearted, you must be happy. If fear and love cannot coexist and if it is impossible to be wholly fearful and remain alive, the only possible whole state is that of love. There is no difference between love and joy. Therefore, the only possible whole state is wholly joyous. To heal or to make joyous is therefore the same as to integrate and to make one. That is why it makes no difference to what part or by what part of the sonship the healing is offered. Every part benefits and benefits equally. You are being blessed by every beneficent thought of any of your brothers anywhere. You should want to bless them in return out of gratitude. You need not know them individually or they you. The light is so strong that it radiates throughout the sonship and returns thanks to the Father for radiating his joy upon it. Only God's holy children are worthy channels of his beautiful joy because only they are beautiful enough to hold it by sharing it. It is impossible for a child of God to love his neighbor except as himself. That is why the healer's prayer is, Let me know this brother as I know myself. Part 1. The Invitation to the Holy Spirit Healing is a thought by which two minds perceive their oneness and become glad. This gladness calls to every part of the sonship to rejoice with them and lets God go out into them and through them. Only the healed mind can experience revelation with lasting effect because revelation is an experience of pure joy. If you do not choose to be wholly joyous, your mind cannot have what it does not choose to be. Remember that spirit knows no difference between having and being. The higher mind thinks according to the laws spirit obeys and therefore honors only the laws of God. To spirit, getting is meaningless and giving is all. Having everything, spirit holds everything by giving it and thus creates as the Father created. While this kind of thinking is totally alien to having things, even to the lower mind, it is quite comprehensible in connection with ideas. If you share a physical possession, you do divide its ownership. If you share an idea, however, you do not lessen it. All of it is still yours, although all of it has been given away. Further, 
If the one to whom you give it accepts it as his, he reinforces it in your mind and thus increases it. If you can accept the concept that the world is one of ideas, the whole belief in the false association the ego makes between giving and losing is gone. Let us start our process of reawakening with just a few simple concepts. Thoughts increase by being given away. The more who believe in them, the stronger they become. Everything is an idea. How then can giving and losing be associated? This is the invitation to the Holy Spirit. I have said already that I can reach up and bring the Holy Spirit down to you, but I can bring him to you only at your own invitation. The Holy Spirit is in your right mind as he was in mine. The Bible says, may the mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus and uses this as a blessing. It is the blessing of miracle-mindedness. It asks that you may think as I thought, joining with me in Christ thinking. The Holy Spirit is the only part of the Holy Trinity that has a symbolic function. He is referred to as the healer, the comforter, and the guide. He is also described as something separate apart from the Father and from the Son. I myself said, If I go, I will send you another comforter and he will abide with you. His symbolic function makes the Holy Spirit difficult to understand because symbolism is open to different interpretations. As a man and also one of God's creations, my right thinking, which came from the Holy Spirit or the universal inspiration, taught me first and foremost that this inspiration is for all. I could not have it myself without knowing this. The word know is proper in this context because the Holy Spirit is so close to knowledge that he calls it forth, or better, allows it to come. I have spoken before of the higher or true perception, which is so near to the which is so near to truth that God Himself can flow across the little gap. Knowledge is always ready to flow everywhere, but it cannot oppose. Therefore, you can obstruct it, although you can never lose it. The Holy Spirit is the Christ mind, which is aware of the knowledge that lies beyond perception. He came into being with this separation as a protection, inspiring the atonement principle at the same time. Before that, there was no need for healing for no one was comfortless. The voice of the Holy Spirit is the call to atonement or the restoration of the integrity of the mind. When the atonement is complete and the whole sonship is healed, there will be no call to return. But what God creates is eternal. The Holy Spirit will remain with the sons of God to bless their creations and keep them in the light of joy. God honored even the miscreations of his children because they had made them. But he also blessed his children with a way of thinking that could raise their perceptions so high they could reach almost back to him. The Holy Spirit is the mind of the atonement. He represents a state of mind close enough to one-mindedness 
that transfer to it is at last possible. Perception is not knowledge, but it can be transferred to knowledge or cross over into it. It might even be more helpful here to use the literal meaning of transferred or carried over since the last step is taken by God. The Holy Spirit, the shared inspiration of all the sonship, induces a kind of perception in which many elements are like those in the kingdom of heaven itself. First, its universal its universality is perfectly clear, and no one who attains it could believe for one instant that sharing it involves anything but gain. Second, it is incapable of attack and is therefore truly open. This means that although it does not engender knowledge, it does not obstruct it in any way. Finally, it points the way beyond the healing that it brings and leads the mind beyond its own integration toward the paths of creation. It is at this point that sufficient quantitative change occurs to produce a real qualitative shift. Welcome to the reading, A Course in Miracles, Chapter 5, Part 2, The Voice for God. Healing is not creating, it is reparation. The Holy Spirit promotes healing by looking beyond it to what the children of God were before healing was needed and will be when they have been healed. This alteration of the time sequence should be quite familiar because it is very familiar to the shift in perception of time that the miracle introduces. The Holy Spirit is the motivation for miracle mindedness, the decision to heal the separation by letting it go. Your will is still in you because God placed it in your mind. And although you can keep it asleep, you cannot obliterate it. God himself keeps your will alive by transmitting it from his high mind to yours as long as there is time. The miracle itself is a reflection of this union of will between father and son. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of joy. He is the call to return with which God blessed the minds of his separated sons. This is the vocation of the mind. The mind had no calling until the separation because before that it had only being and would not have understood the call to right thinking. The Holy Spirit is God's answer to the separation the means by which the atonement heals until the whole mind returns to creating. The principle of atonement and the separation began at the same time. When the ego was made, God placed in the mind the call to joy. This call is so strong that the ego always dissolves at its sound. That is why you must choose to hear one of two voices within you. One you made yourself, and that one is not of God. But the other is given you by God, who asks you only to listen to it. The Holy Spirit is in you in a very literal sense. 
His is the voice that calls you back to where you were before and will be again. It is possible even in this world to hear only that voice and no other. It takes effort and great willingness to learn. It is the final lesson that I learned and God's sons are as equal as learners as they are uh, as they are as sons. You are the kingdom of heaven. But you have let the belief in darkness enter your mind and so you need a new light. The Holy Spirit is the radiance that you must let banish the idea of darkness. His is the glory before which disassociation falls away. And the kingdom of heaven breaks through into its own. Before the separation, you did not need guidance. You knew as you will know again, but as you do not know now. God does not guide because he can share only perfect knowledge. Guidance is evaluative because it implies there is a right way and also a wrong way, one to be chosen and the other to be avoided. By choosing one, you give up the other. The choice for the Holy Spirit is the choice for God. God is not in you in a literal sense, you are a part of him. When you choose to leave him, when you chose to leave him, he gave you a voice to speak for him because he could no longer share his knowledge with you without hindrance. Direct communication was broken because you had made another voice. The Holy Spirit calls you both to remember and to forget. You have chosen to be in a state of opposition in which opposites are possible. As a result, there are choices you must make. In the holy state, the will is free so that its creative power is unlimited and choice is meaningless. Freedom to choose is the same power as freedom to create, but its application is different. Choosing depends on a split mind. The Holy Spirit is one way of choosing. God did not leave his children comfortless, even though they chose to leave him. The voice they put in their minds was not the voice for his will, for which the Holy Spirit speaks. The voice of the Holy Spirit does not command because it is incapable of arrogance. It does not demand because it does not seek control. It does not overcome because it does not attack. It merely reminds. It is compelling only because of what it reminds you of. It brings to your mind the other way, remaining quiet even in the midst of the turmoil you may make. The voice for God is always quiet because it speaks of peace. Peace is stronger than war because it heals. War is division, not increase. No one gains from strife. What profiteth if a, it a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If you listen to the wrong voice, you have lost sight of your soul. You cannot lose it, but you cannot know it. It is therefore lost to you until you choose right. The Holy Spirit is your guide in choosing. He is in the part of your mind that always speaks for the right choice because he speaks for God. He is your remaining communication 
with God, which you can interrupt but cannot destroy. The Holy Spirit is the way in which God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Both heaven and earth are in you because the call of both is in your mind. The voice for God comes from your own altars to him. These altars are not things, they are devotions. Yet you have other devotions now. Your divided devotion has given you the two voices and you must choose at which altar you want to serve. The call you answer now is an evaluation because it is a decision. The decision is very simple. It is made on the basis of which call is worth more to you. The mind will always be like yours. My mind will always be like yours because we were created as equals. It was only my decision that gave me all power in heaven and earth. My only gift to you is to help you make the same decision. This decision is the choice to share it because the decision itself is the decision to share. It is made by giving and is therefore the one choice that resembles true creation. I am your model for decision. By deciding for God, I showed you that this decision can be made and that you can make it. I have assured you that the mind that decided for me is also in you and that you can let it change you just as it changed me. This mind is unequivocal because it hears only one voice and answers in only one way. You are the light of the world with me. Rest does not come from sleeping, but from waking. The Holy Spirit is the call to awaken and be glad. The world is very tired because it is the idea of weariness. Our task is the joyous one of waking it to the call for God. Everyone will answer the call of the Holy Spirit or the Sonship cannot be as one. What better vocation could there be for any part of the kingdom than to restore it to the perfect integration that can make it whole? Hear only this through the Holy Spirit within you and teach your brothers to listen as I am teaching you. When you are tempted by the wrong voice, call on me to remind you how to heal by sharing my decision and making it stronger. As we share this goal, we increase its power to attract the whole sonship and to bring it back into the oneness in which it was created. Remember that yoke means join together and burden means message. Let us restate, my yoke is easy and my burden is light in this way. Let us join together for my message is light. I have enjoined you to behave as I behaved, but we must respond to the same mind to do this. This mind is the Holy Spirit, whose will is for God always. He teaches you how to keep me as the model for your thought and to behave like me as a result. The power of our joint motivation is beyond belief, but not beyond accomplishment. What we can accomplish together has no limits because the call for God is the call to the unlimited. Child of God, my message is for you to hear 
and give away as you answer the Holy Spirit within you. Welcome to the reading, A Course in Miracles, Chapter 5, Part 3, The Guide to Salvation. The way to recognize your brother is by recognizing the Holy Spirit in him. I have already said that the Holy Spirit is the bridge for the transfer of perception to knowledge. So we can use the terms as if they were related because in his mind, they are. This relationship must be in his mind because unless it were, the separation between the two ways of thinking would not be open to healing. He is part of the Holy Trinity because his mind is partly yours and also also partly God's. This needs clarification, not in statement, but in experience. The Holy Spirit is the idea of healing. Being thought, the idea gains as it is shared. Being the call for God, it is also the idea of God. Since you're part of God, it is also the idea of yourself as well as of all his creations. The idea of the Holy Spirit shares the property of other ideas because it follows the laws of the universe of which it is a part. It is strengthened by being given away. It increases in you as you give it to your brother. Your brother does not have to be aware of the Holy Spirit in himself or in you for this miracle to occur. He may have disassociated the call for God just as you have. This disassociation is healed in both of you as you become aware of the call for God in him and thus acknowledge its being. There are two diametrically opposed ways of seeing your brother. They must both be in your mind because you are the perceiver. They must also be in his because you are perceiving him. See him through the Holy Spirit in his mind and you will recognize him in yours. What you acknowledge in your brother, you are acknowledging in yourself. And what you share, you strengthen. The voice of the Holy Spirit is weak in you. That is why you must share it. It must be increased in strength before you can hear it. It is impossible to hear it in yourself while it is so weak in your mind. It is not weak in itself, but it is limited by your unwillingness to hear it. If you make the mistake of looking for the Holy Spirit in yourself alone, your thoughts will frighten you because by adopting the ego's viewpoint, you are undertaking an ego alien journey with the ego as guide. This is bound to produce fear. Delay is of the ego because time is its concept. Both time and delay are meaningless in eternity. I have said before that the Holy Spirit is God's answer to the ego. Everything of which the Holy Spirit reminds you is in direct opposition to the ego's notions because true and false perceptions are themselves opposed. The Holy Spirit has the task of undoing what the ego has made. He undoes it at the same level on which the ego operates. 
or the mind would be unable to understand the change. I have repeatedly emphasized that one level of the mind is not understandable to another. So it is with the ego and the Holy Spirit, with time and eternity. Eternity is an idea of God, so the Holy Spirit understands it perfectly. Time is a belief of the ego, so the lower mind, which is the ego's domain, accepts it without question. The only aspect of time that is eternal is now. The Holy Spirit is the mediator between the interpretations of the ego and the knowledge of the spirit. His ability to deal with symbols enables him to work with the ego's beliefs in its own language. His ability to look beyond symbols into eternity enables him to understand the laws of God for which he speaks. He can therefore perform the function of reinterpreting what the ego makes, not by destruction, but by understanding. Understanding is light, and light leads to knowledge. The Holy Spirit is in light because he is in you who are light, but you yourself do not know this. It is therefore the task of the Holy Spirit to reinterpret you on behalf of God. You cannot understand yourself alone. This is because you have no meaning apart from your rightful place in the sonship. And the rightful place of the sonship is God. This is your life, your eternity, and yourself. It is of this that the Holy Spirit reminds you. It is this that the Holy Spirit sees. This vision frightens the ego because it is so calm. Peace is the ego's greatest enemy because according to its interpretation of reality, war is the guarantee of its survival. The ego becomes strong in strife. If you believe there is strife, you will react viciously because the idea of danger has entered your mind. The idea itself is an appeal to the ego. The Holy Spirit is as vigilant as the ego to the call of danger, opposing it with his strength just as the ego welcomes it. The Holy Spirit counters this welcome by welcoming peace. Eternity and peace are as closely related as are time and war. Perception derives meaning from relationships. Those you accept are the foundations of your beliefs. The separation is merely another term for a split mind. The ego is the symbol of separation, just as the Holy Spirit is the symbol of peace. What you perceive in others, you are strengthening in yourself. You may let your mind misperceive, but the Holy Spirit lets your mind reinterpret its own misperceptions. The Holy Spirit is the perfect teacher. He uses only what your mind already understands to teach you that you do not understand it. The Holy Spirit can deal with a reluctant learner without going counter to his mind because part of it is still for God. Despite the ego's attempts to conceal this part, it is still much stronger than the ego, although the ego does not recognize it. The Holy Spirit recognizes it perfectly because it is his own dwelling place. 
the place in the mind where he is at home. You are at home there too because it is a place of peace and peace is of God. You who are part of God are not at home except in his peace. If peace is eternal, you are at home only in eternity. The ego made the world as it perceives it, but the Holy Spirit, the reinterpreter of what the ego made, sees the world as a teaching device for bringing you home. The Holy Spirit must perceive time and reinterpret it into the timeless. He must work through opposites because he must work with and for a mind that is in opposition. Correct and learn and be open to learning. You have not made truth, but truth can still set you free. Look as the Holy Spirit looks and understand as he understands. His understanding looks back to God in remembrance of me. He is in communion with God always and he is part of you. He is your guide to salvation because he holds the remembrance of things past and to come and brings them to the present. He holds this gladness gently in your mind, asking only that you increase it in his name by sharing it to increase his joy in you. Welcome to the reading, A Course in Miracles, Chapter 5, Part 4, Teaching and Healing. What fear has hidden still is part of you. Joining the atonement is the way out of fear. The Holy Spirit will help you reinterpret everything that you perceive as fearful and teach you that only what is loving is true. Truth is beyond your ability to destroy, but entirely within your ability to accept. It belongs to you because, as an extension of God, you created it with him. It is yours because it is part of you, just as you are part of God because he created you. Nothing that is good can be lost because it comes from the Holy Spirit, the voice for creation. Nothing that is not good was ever created and therefore cannot be protected. The atonement is the guarantee of the safety of the kingdom and the union of the sonship is its protection. The ego cannot prevail against the kingdom because the sonship is united. In the presence of those who hear the Holy Spirit's call to be as one, the ego fades away and is undone. What the ego makes, it keeps to itself, and so it is without strength. Its existence is unshared. It does not die. It was merely never born. Physical birth is not a beginning. It is a continuing. Everything that continues has already been born. It will increase as you are willing to return the unhealed part of your mind to the higher part returning it undivided to creation. 
I have come to give you the foundation so your own thoughts can make you really free. You have carried the burden of unshared ideas that are too weak to increase. But having made them, you did not realize how to undo them. You cannot cancel out your past errors alone. They will not disappear from your mind without the atonement, a remedy not of your making. The atonement must be understood as a pure act of sharing. That is what I meant when I said it is possible even in this world to listen to one voice. If you are part of God and the sonship is one, you cannot be limited to the self the ego sees. Every loving thought held in any part of the sonship belongs to every part. It is shared because it is loving. Sharing is God's way of creating and also yours. The ego can keep you in exile from the kingdom, but in the kingdom itself, it has no power. Ideas of the spirit do not leave the mind that thinks them, nor can they conflict with each other. However, the ideas of the ego can conflict because they occur at different levels and also include opposite thoughts at the same level. It is impossible to share opposing thoughts. You can share only the thoughts that are of God and that he keeps for you. And of such is the kingdom of heaven. The rest remains with you until the Holy Spirit has reinterpreted them in the light of the kingdom, making them too worthy of being shared. When they have been sufficiently purified, he lets you give them away. The decision to share them is their purification. I heard one voice because I understood that I could not atone for myself alone. Listening to one voice implies the decision to share it in order to hear it yourself. The mind that was in me is still irresistibly drawn to every mind created by God because God's wholeness is the wholeness of his son. You cannot be hurt and do not want to show your brother anything except your wholeness. Show him that he cannot hurt you and hold nothing against him or you hold it against yourself. This is the meaning of turning the other cheek. Teaching is done in many ways, above all by example. Teaching should be healing because it is the sharing of ideas and the recognition that to share ideas is to strengthen them. I cannot forget my need to teach what I have learned which arose in me because I learned it. I call upon you to teach what you have learned because by doing, by so doing, you can depend on it. Make it dependable in my name because my name is the name of God's son. What I learned, I give you freely. And the mind that was in me rejoices as you choose to hear it. The Holy Spirit atones in all of us by undoing and thus lifts the burden you have placed in your mind. By following him, you are led back to God where you belong. And how can you find the way except by taking your brother with you? My part in the atonement is not complete until you join it and give it away. As you teach, so shall you learn. I will never leave you or forsake you because to forsake you would be to forsake myself and God who created me. 
you forsake yourself and God if you forsake any of your brothers. You must learn to see them as they are and understand they belong to God as you do. How could you treat your brother better than by rendering unto God the things that are God's? The atonement gives you the power of a healed mind, but the power to create is of God. Therefore, those who have been forgiven must devote themselves first to healing because having received the idea of healing, they must give it to hold it. The full power of creation cannot be expressed as long as any of God's ideas is withheld from the kingdom. The joint will of the sonship is the only creator that can create like the Father because only the complete can think completely and the thinking of God lacks nothing. Everything you think that is not through the Holy Spirit is lacking. How can you who are so holy suffer? All your past except its beauty is gone, and nothing is left but a blessing. I have saved all your kindnesses and every loving thought you ever had. I have purified them of the errors that hid their light and kept them for you in their own perfect radiance. They are beyond destruction and beyond guilt. They came from the Holy Spirit within you, and we know that God, what God creates is eternal. You can indeed depart in peace because I have loved you as I loved myself. You go with my blessing and for my blessing. Hold it and share it that it may always be ours. I place the peace of God in your heart and in your hands to hold and share. The heart is pure to hold it and the hands are strong to give it. We cannot lose. My judgment is as strong as the wisdom of God in whose heart and hands we have our being. His quiet children are his blessed sons. The thoughts of God are with you. Welcome to the reading, A Course in Miracles, Chapter 5, Part 5, The Ego's Use of Guilt. Perhaps some of our concepts will become clearer and more personally meaningful if the ego's use of guilt is clarified. The ego has a purpose, just as the Holy Spirit has. The ego's purpose is fear, because only the fearful can be egotistic. The ego's logic is as impeccable as that of the Holy Spirit, because your mind has the means as at its disposal to side with heaven or earth as it elects. But again, remember that both are in you. In heaven, there is no guilt because the kingdom is attained through the atonement, which releases you to create. The word create is appropriate here because once What you have made is undone by the Holy Spirit. The blessed residue is restored and therefore continues in creation. What is truly blessed is incapable of giving rise to guilt and must give rise to joy. This makes it invulnerable to the ego because its peace is unsalable. 
It is invulnerable to disruption because it is whole. Guilt is always disruptive. Anything that engenders fear is divisive because it obeys the law of division. If the ego is the symbol of the separation, it is also the symbol of guilt. Guilt is more than merely not of God. It is the symbol of attack on God. This is a totally totally meaningless concept except to the ego. But do not underestimate the power of the ego's belief in it. This is the belief from which all guilt really stems. The ego is the part of the mind that believes in division. How could part of God detach itself without believing it is attacking him? We spoke before of the authority problem as based on the concept of usurping God's power. The ego believes that this is what you did before because it believes that it is you. If you identify with the ego, you must perceive yourself as guilty. Whenever you respond to your ego, you will experience guilt and you will fear punishment. The ego is quite literally a fearful thought. However ridiculous the idea of attacking God may be to the sane mind, never forget that the ego is not sane. It represents a delusional system and speaks for it. Listening to the ego's voice means that you believe it is possible to attack God and that a part of him has been torn away from you, by you. Fear of retaliation from without follows because the severity of the guilt is so acute that it must be projected. Whatever you accept into your mind has reality for you. It is your acceptance of it that makes it real. If you enthrone the ego in your mind, your allowing it to enter makes it your reality. This is because the mind is capable of creating reality or making illusions. I said before that you must learn to think with God. To think with him is to think like him. This engenders joy, not guilt, because it is natural. Guilt is a sure sign that your thinking is unnatural. Unnatural thinking will always be attended with guilt because It is the belief in sin. The ego does not perceive sin as a lack of love, but as a positive act of assault. This is necessary to the ego's survival because as soon as you regard sin as a lack, you will automatically attempt to remedy the situation and you will succeed. The ego regards this as doom, but you must learn to regard it as freedom. The guiltless mind cannot suffer. Being sane, the mind heals the body because it has been healed. The sane mind cannot conceive of illness because it cannot conceive of attacking anyone or anything. I said before that illness is a form of magic. It might be better to say that it is a form of magical solution. The ego believes that by punishing itself, it will mitigate the punishment of God. Yet even in this, it is arrogant. It attributes to God a punishing intent and then takes this intent as its own prerogative. It tries to usurp all the functions of God as it perceives them 
because it recognizes that only total allegiance can be trusted. The ego cannot oppose the laws of God any more than you can, but it can interpret them according to what it wants, just as you can. That is why the question, what do you want, must be answered. You are answering it every minute and every second, and each moment of decision is a judgment that is anything but ineffectual. Its effects will follow automatically until the decision is changed. Remember, though, that the alternatives themselves are alterable. The Holy Spirit, like the ego, is a decision. Together, they constitute all the alternatives the mind can accept and obey. The Holy Spirit and the ego are the only choices open to you. God created one, so you cannot eradicate it. You made the other, and so you can. Only what God creates is irreversible and unchangeable. What you made can always be changed because when you do not think like God, you are not really thinking at all. Delusional ideas are not real thoughts, although you can believe in them, but you are wrong. The function of thought comes from God and is in God. As part of his thought, you cannot think apart from him. Irrational thought is disordered thought. God himself orders your thought because your thought was created by him. Guilt feelings are always a sign that you do not know this. They also show that you believe you can think apart from God and want to. Every disordered thought is attended by guilt at its inception and maintained by guilt in its continuance. Guilt is inescapable by those who believe they order their own thoughts and must therefore obey their dictates. This makes them feel responsible for their errors without recognizing that by accepting this responsibility, they are reacting irresponsibly. If the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself, and I assure you that it is, then the responsibility for what is atoned for cannot be yours. The dilemma cannot be resolved except by accepting the solution of undoing. You would be responsible for the effects of all your wrong thinking if it could not be undone. The purpose of the atonement is to save the past in purified form only. If you accept the remedy for disordered thought, a remedy whose efficiency is beyond doubt, how can its symptoms remain? The continuing decision to remain separated is the only possible reason for continuing guilt feelings. We have said this before, but did not emphasize the destructive results of the decision. Any decision of the mind will affect both behavior and experience. What you want, you expect. This is not delusional. Your mind does make your future and it will turn it back to full creation at any minute if it accepts the atonement first. It will also return to full creation the instant it has done so, having given up its disordered thought the proper ordering of thought becomes quite apparent.
Welcome to the reading, A Course in Miracles, Chapter 5, Part 6, Time and Eternity. God in his knowledge is not waiting, but his kingdom is bereft while you wait. All the sons of God are waiting for your return, just as you are waiting for theirs. Delay does not matter in eternity, but it is tragic in time. You have elected to be in time rather than eternity and therefore believe you are in time. Yet your election is both free and alterable. You do not belong in time. Your place is only in eternity where God himself placed you forever. Guilt feelings are the preservers of time. They induce fears of retaliation or abandonment and thus ensure that the future will be like the past. This is the ego's continuity, continuity. It gives the ego a false sense of security by believing that you cannot escape from it, but you can and must. God offers you the continuity of eternity in exchange. When you choose to make this exchange, you will simultaneously exchange guilt for joy, viciousness for love, and pain for peace. My role is only to unchain your will and set it free. Your ego cannot accept this freedom and will oppose it at every possible moment and in every possible way. And as its maker, you recognize what it can do because you gave it the power to do it. Remember the kingdom always and remember that you who are part of the kingdom cannot be lost. The mind that was in me is in you, for God creates with perfect fairness. Let the Holy Spirit remind you always of his fairness, and let me teach you how to share it with your brothers. How else can the chance to claim it for yourself be given you? The two voices speak for different interpretations of the same thing simultaneously or almost simultaneously, for the ego always speaks first. Alternate interpretations were unnecessary until the first one was made. The ego speaks in judgment and the Holy Spirit reverses its decision. Much as a higher court has the power to reverse a lower court's decisions in the world. The ego's decisions are always wrong because they are based on error they were made to uphold. Nothing the ego perceives is interpreted correctly. Not only does the ego cite scripture for its purpose, but it even interprets scripture as a witness for itself. The Bible is a fearful thing in the ego's judgment. Perceiving it as frightening, it interprets it fearfully. Being afraid, you do not appeal to the higher court because you believe its judgment would also be against you. There are many examples of how the ego's interpretations are misleading, but a few will suffice to show how the Holy Spirit can reinterpret them in his own light. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. He interprets to mean what you consider worth cultivating, you will cultivate in yourself. Your judgment of what is worthy makes it worthy for you. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, is easily reinterpreted if you remember that ideas increase only by being shared. The statement emphasizes that vengeance cannot be shared. Give it therefore to the Holy Spirit who will undo it in you because you, 
who will undo it in you because it does not belong in your mind, which is part of God. I will visit the sins of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation, as interpreted by the ego, is particularly vicious. It becomes merely an attempt to guarantee the ego's own survival. To the Holy Spirit, the statement means that in later generations, he can still reinterpret reinterpret what former generations had misunderstood and thus release the thoughts from the ability to produce fear. The wicked shall perish becomes a statement of atonement if the word perish is understood as be undone. Every loveless thought must be undone, a word the ego cannot even understand. To the ego, to be undone means to be destroyed. The ego will not be destroyed because it is part of your thought, but because it is uncreative and therefore unsharing, it will be reinterpreted to release you from fear. The part of your mind that you have given to the ego will merely return to the kingdom where your whole mind belongs. You can delay the completion of the kingdom, but you cannot introduce the concept of fear into it. You need not fear the higher court will condemn you. It will merely dismiss the case against you. There can be no case against a child of God, and every witness to guilt in God's creations is bearing false witness to God himself. Appeal everything you believe gladly to God's own higher court, because it speaks for him and therefore speaks truly. It will dismiss the case against you, however carefully you have built it up. The case may be foolproof, but it is not God-proof. The Holy Spirit will not hear it because he can only witness truly. His verdict will always be, Thine is the kingdom, because he was given to you to remind you of what you are. When I said, I am come as a light into the world, I meant that I came to share the light with you. Remember my reference to the ego's dark glass and remember also that I said, do not look there. It is still true that where you look to find yourself is up to you. Your patience with your brother is your patience with yourself. It is not a... Is not a child of God worth patience? I have shown you infinite patience because my will is that of our Father, from whom I learned of infinite patience. His voice was in me as it is in you, speaking for patience towards the Sonship in the name of its Creator. Now, you must learn that only infinite patience produces immediate effects. This is the way in which time is exchanged for eternity. Infinite patience calls upon infinite love, and by producing results now, it renders time unnecessary. We have repeatedly said that time is a learning device to be abolished, when it is no longer useful. The Holy Spirit, who speaks for God in time, also knows that time is meaningless. He reminds you of this in every passing moment of time because it is his special function to return you to eternity and remain to bless your creations there. He is the only blessing you can truly give because he is truly blessed. Because he has been given you freely by God, 
you must give him as you received him. Welcome to the reading, A Course in Miracles, Chapter 5, Part 7, The Decision for God. Do you really believe you can make a voice that can drown out God's? Do you really believe you can devise a thought system that can separate you from him? Do you really believe you can plan for your safety and joy better than he can? You need be careful you need be neither careful nor careless. You need merely cast your cares upon him because he careth for you. You are his care because he loves you. His voice reminds you always that all hope is yours because of his care. You cannot choose to escape his care because that is not his will. But you can choose to accept his care and use the infinite power of his care for all those he created by it. There have been many healers who did not heal themselves. They have not moved mountains by their faith because their faith was not whole. Some of them have healed the sick at times, but they have not raised the dead. Unless the healer heals himself, he cannot believe that there is no order of difficulty in miracles. He has not learned that every mind God created is equally worthy of being healed because God created it whole. You are merely asked to return to God the mind as he created it. He asks you only for what he gave, knowing that this giving will heal you. Sanity is wholeness, and the sanity of your brothers is yours. Why should you listen to the endless, insane calls you think are made upon you when you can know the voice for God is in you? God commended his spirit to you and asks that you commend yours to him. He wills to keep it in perfect peace because you are of one mind and spirit with him. Excluding yourself from the atonement is the ego's last ditch defense of its own existence. It reflects both the ego's need to separate and your willingness to side with its separateness. This willingness means that you do not want to be healed. But the time is now. You have not been asked to work out the plan of salvation yourself because, as I told you before, the remedy could not be of your making. God himself gave you the perfect correction for everything you made that is not in accord with his holy will. I am making his plan perfectly explicit to you and will also tell you of your part in it and how urgent it is to fulfill it. God weeps at the sacrifice of his children who believe they are lost to him. Whenever you are not wholly joyous, it is because you have reacted with a lack of love to one of God's creations. Perceiving this as sin, you become defensive because you expect attack. The decision to react in this way is yours and can therefore be undone. It cannot be undone by repentance in the usual sense because this implies guilt. If you allow yourself to feel guilty, you will reinforce the error rather than allow it to be undone for you. Decision cannot be difficult. This is obvious if you realize that you must already have decided not to be wholly joyous if that is how you feel. Therefore, the first step in the undoing is to recognize that you actively decided wrongly, but can as actively decide otherwise. Be very firm with yourself in this and keep yourself fully aware that the undoing process, 
which does not come from you is nevertheless within you because God placed it there. Your part is merely to return your thinking to the point at which the error was made and give it over to the atonement in peace. Say this to yourself as sincerely as you can, remembering that the Holy Spirit will respond fully to your slightest invitation. I must have decided wrongly because I am not at peace. I made the decision myself, but I can also decide otherwise. I want to decide otherwise because I want to be at peace. I do not feel guilty because the Holy Spirit will undo all the consequences of my wrong decision if I will let him. I choose to let him by allowing him to decide for God for me.